Thank you, Chris, and we hope that some of you will consider joining the sustainability mission in November. You'll definitely find it rewarding. And I would like to introduce Shai Agassi, somewhere there. Uh, before I do so, I'd like to acknowledge IBM's partnership with the Chamber for this event. The energy revolution requires more green energy, or at least better managed and more efficient energy from utility companies. Enabling smart grid transformation is a key IBM initiative. IBM experts are working with utility companies around the world to accelerate the adoption of, small, of smart grids to enable our energy systems to be truly intelligent, instrumented, and interconnected. IBM is involved in seven of the world's 10 largest automated meter management projects and working with clients in nearly 50 smart grid engagements around the world to shape the future of the smart grid. At the forefront of this transformation is the development of an intelligent utility network, which helps leading utility companies to do just this, fundamentally transform the way power is generated. Partnering with IBM locally, companies such as Energy Australia and Country Energy are well advanced in their smart grid technologies with real investments being made to create Australia's intelligent, instrumented and interconnected smart grid. It is these innovations that make IBM a world leader in the energy revolution and a fitting partner for today's event. Shai Agassi, an Israeli now based in the United States, is a serial entrepreneur and and rose to number two at SAP globally. Today, Shai is focused on one of this century's biggest challenges, moving the world from oil-based to sustainable transportation. Shai works with government leaders, auto manufacturers, energy companies, and others to make his vision zero emission vehicle powered by electricity from renewable sources a reality in countries around the globe. This vision was inspired by a profound question posed at the World Economic Forum in, in 2005. How do we make the world a better place by 2020? With a passion for tackling large-scale challenges, Shai sought to answer this question with, with a pragmatic solution to free cars from oil, reduce harmful tailpipe emissions, and usher in an era of sustainable transportation. Agassi founded Better Place, and in 2007, officially launched the company. In 2008, Israel became the first country in the Renault-Nissan Alliance, the first car maker, to embrace the Better Place model of building open network infrastructure to enable mass ad adoption of electric vehicles and delivery transportation as a sustainable service. Denmark, Australia, California, Hawaii, and Ontario have followed suit. Today, Shy and Better Place are in discussions with many countries, car makers, and other potential partners around the, around the globe. Shai's vi visionary leadership with the Better Place model has been recognized widely. Time magazine named him to the 2009 Time 100, the world's 100 most influential people, and one of Time's Heroes of the Environment 2008. F Fast Company, placed him third on its 100 most creative people in business list. Most recently, Scientific American magazine uh, included him in the 2009 Scientific American one, uh, 10, a select group of 10 people who have demonstrated outstanding commit commitment to harnessing new technology in the interests of humanity. Shai remains an active member of the Forum of Young Global Leaders of the World Economic Forum, where he focuses on climate change, transportation, and other issues. He's also a member of the Copenhagen Climate Council and the advisory board of the Corporate Echo Forum. Please welcome Shai Agassi. Note, note to self, shorten the bio on the web. Uh, I apologize for the lengthy. Um, story we put up on myself. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the chamber. Um, Anthony, I owed you a favor uh, for taking Guy away from you. Um, I, I hope we'll be even by the end of today. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd like to tell you our story uh, about all of us. It's a story about uh, the biggest problem that we're facing and the biggest opportunity we all uh, have in front of us. 
And, uh, and during that story, I'd like to share with you both the sort of the pragmatic solution, uh, but I don't want you to feel like you're being pushed to buy cars today because that's not what we're going to do. But really take it as a, uh, an example of how do we tackle some of the giant problems that we're facing as humanity. We, uh, we changed from a globe that uh, has to feed and serve about 2 billion people when um, we figured out how to solve medicine. We've figured out how to extend the life of uh, our life from about 45 years to about 87 years. We added two more generations within a span of a generation. And we got to about 6 billion people. We're about to go to 9 billion people. And yet we haven't changed anything. We, we have built a template. Um, and we repeated that template. It's called the American Dream. We took it everywhere. Um, somewhere the dream has become a nightmare. And in the process of that, we are destroying the mere planet on which we live uh, while we're reducing NASA's budget to go find another planet. Um, that's not sustainable. Interestingly enough, we looked at sustainability as a question of do we want a sustainable environment or do we want a sustainable economy? And we're realizing right now that it's not a, it's not a question of either or. Getting one will destroy the other. Um, I'll give you just one small example. Uh, the Global 20 in the last 12 months have saved one and a half trillion dollars on oil purchase. It just so happens that if you aggregate the G20 stimulus package, it adds up to one and a half trillion dollars. In other words, what we saved on oil, we put back into the economy. It wasn't that we saved on oil any carbon. It wasn't that we reduced oil consumption by any order of magnitude. By the way, for those of you who ask yourself, how much did we reduce? We went from 88 million barrels a day to 82 million barrels a day. But we're now in a situation where we're realizing that the questions about environment are directly attached to the questions related to our own pockets and the macroeconomic environment in which we live. And so with that background, we're facing one of the greatest opportunities in our lives. We ran out of a planet. We ran out of the economy. We ran out of jobs. We ran out of a car industry. Um, we ran out of choices. And we can solve one of them, one of those problems, not tackling the others. We can do scrappage of cars, sort of shooting adrenaline into the heart of an industry. But at some point, it will run out, the adrenaline, and you get a heart attack. We can prop up a car company for about six quarters, but then when they lose $50 billion in those six quarters, you got to fix it. We can ignore the environment, but we can do that at the peril of about one or two years, and then somehow the polar caps melt. We can't do one without the others. We got to start looking at holistic problems. We got to solve them. And so on a random Tuesday afternoon in the middle of a mountain in Switzerland, of all places, I got hit with a question that was a conversational starter. What are you going to do to make the world a better place by 2020? I try to answer version 7 of SAP's suite, and that was not accepted as a good answer. <laughs> if you can bring up the house lights, I'm, I'm a bit claustrophobic, even when I talk in open high spaces. If you don't mind, I'll go down. Um, the that question triggered a bunch of other questions. I think, I think it was Henry Kissinger that uh, got asked on a TV program, why do uh, Jews answer a question with a question? And he said, why wouldn't they? <laughs> um, and so I started a random set of questions, one after the other. Um, how do you run an entire country without oil was the question I got in my mind next. And the reason I got there was actually not an environmental reason, I have to admit. Um, I looked deep into my passions, and the first passion I found inside me as a kid that was born in Israel and grew up in Israel, and then saw a world without the fear, the daily fear you have in Israel, was how do you bring peace to the Middle East? In a sense, my debt to the past.